SAC goes down, AIG is on the prowl, and Bank of Internet is flying high. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show. It is Tuesday. I think it is Tuesday. Right? It, is Tuesday. it is Tuesday. And I am Matt Kopenheffer. This is David Hansen. David, last night in the Packers Bears game, Aaron Rodgers went down at the very beginning of the game. That's a big deal for the Packers, right? Very big deal. What is the business equivalent of Aaron Rodgers going down with an injury? Well, considering Seneca Wallace replaced him, and Seneca Wallace, great athlete, but not a great quarterback, that'd be like Elon Musk being replaced with like a toad. <laughs> That's how bad it would oh, be. Is, and there, there is, there's is like an harsh. Elon Musk bubble right now. I mean, everything he touches turns to gold. So if he were to go and replace by a toad, not good. Elon Musk pulling a hammy. Warren Buffett pulling a hammy. Yeah, it would not be good. All right, getting on to the headlines. The first headline of today comes from Bloomberg. Cohen's dream of Soros status dies as SAC pleads guilty. This has been the government just, just going after SAC capital. This is an insider trading case. Uh, SAC, if you looked at it from the outside, very successful investment management firm. Here's from the Bloomberg article, the Stanford, Connecticut-based firm's investment returns for clients averaged 25% over the past two decades, and Cohen never posted a losing year in the portfolio he personally oversees. The Cohen is uh, Stevie Cohen. He founded SAC Capital. Uh, you could say a renowned trader, I guess now maybe an infamous trader. Looking ahead, this is what's happening here. There's $1.8 billion in total fines being levied on SAC. SAC can no longer manage outside money. It won't, it won't collapse the firm. The firm won't totally go away. Uh, Stevie Cohen's worth about $9 billion, so the firm will continue to manage his money. But, I mean, this is really significant from the perspective that the government stood very firm on what they were looking for in terms of fines, in terms of uh, the firm pleading guilty to five different counts. Yep. And and this is this is gonna cost jobs. This is, like I said, not ending the firm, but it's, it's gonna be a ghost of itself, mm -hmm. right? And the article compared him to Barry Bonds, too, the, the baseball player. They're saying, if you look at the stats, you mentioned 25 annual, 25% annual returns. We're never really gonna know how much of that was skill and how much of that was maybe cheating. So interesting. And when we think about JP Morgan and the, 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 the criminal charges that they're trying to fight, uh, we gotta wonder how far will the government push that and what could that mean to JP Morgan? What could that mean to shareholders? Because it, it is kind of opaque right now what's going on there and what's gonna end up happening. And then when we think about all of the insider trading cases and then the magnitude of this case, I can't help but think about, I'm a shareholder in Goldman Sachs. Uh, Morgan Stanley is, is right there in that same, same kind of uh, grouping. Is this the kind of thing? We, Goldman and Morgan have been very successful in their trading efforts, very big trading operations, very opaque trading operations. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of, the, one of the complaints against investing in, the, in them is the opacity. And when you look at something like this, you gotta wonder, could something like that be going on there, and I don't. We can't really answer that. Yeah, question. sure. It, it definitely could be happening, but that's one of the risks you assume in investing in one of these banks. One of the any business that you invest in, there's going to be risks that you can't, you don't know. That's why there are risks. So yes, there could be cases brought against these companies, but they've been around for over a hundred years. They've weathered through a lot of things. It could happen, yeah. but I don't think you should lose sleep over wondering. Maybe maybe Goldman's doing insider trading. Right. I don't know. I'm going to lose sleep over it. I don't think that should be the case. The, def the defense of Goldman would be, and, and again, like I said, I'm a Goldman shareholder. The defense of Goldman would be is that you have a certain culture there, and the culture would discourage that. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the, the track record over the past few years, Goldman hasn't been immune from bad headlines. Far from it. But, but you'd hope that the culture would prevent something more pervasive like this mm -hmm. happening there. Second headline of the day coming from the Wall Street Journal. This one is Morgan Stanley. We just talked about them. Morgan Stanley expects AIG suit. So AIG, I guess, suing another person mm -hmm. related to mortgage-backed securities. Not a, not a big surprise here. I guess Morgan Stanley revealed that in their latest filing that they expect a suit. I think it was a couple billion dollars in mortgage securities. So not a, not a huge, mm -hmm. huge portion here. But maybe a payout for Morgan Stanley. Is this a concern for you? Well, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a concern for Morgan Stanley. So if I'm a Morgan Stanley shareholder, I'm not overly concerned about this lawsuit. What I think is interesting when we look at something like this is that 
big banks, big cheap banks, we're looking at them, we're saying, oh, they're cheap, maybe they're good investments, they keep getting hit with lawsuits. It seems like day after day, still. Yep. But then we look over to AIG. AIG looks cheap, but they're on the other side. They're, they're doing initiating this lawsuits. I mean, if we look over at Bank of America and that $8.5 billion settlement that's currently in court, AIG is involved in that on the other side. And they're one of the ones saying, hey, no, we want more money out of this. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting to think about it from that perspective. You got this, this cheap big insurer that's suing everybody versus the cheap big banks that are getting sued by essentially everybody. Uh, to me, that's, a, that's another check mark in AIG's column. Rip. Third headline of the day, we've got another Wall Street Journal. This is B of I Holding. B of I Holding Inc. announces record first quarter net income up 35.5%. Uh, B of I stock, when I checked it before coming up here, was up more than 10%. Not bad. And of course, that's Bank of Internet. Um, for those of you who don't know, we've been talking about it a couple couple times in the show previously, and it had been, the stock had been crushed recently. I think it was mostly just because of valuation concerns. We mentioned yesterday, it'll be interesting to see what do these earnings look like? Are they still growing? And the answer is yes. Net income up 35% there. And when you look at tangible book value, which we kind of care about more than net income, year over year, that's up 23%. So continuing to grow, deposits up 18%. So slowing a little bit there, but this is a bank that's still performing well, still gathering deposits, still making a lot of loans. So that's all well and good, but the question is, over time, will these loans be good loans? And if they are, this bank is going to be a home run. If not, then it could be a little pricey right now. This is, this is a bank that certainly has the, 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 the ability to prove me very wrong when I say what I'm about to say. But you look at 27% year-over-year loan growth, and you look at the fact that we look across a lot of the banking sector, and right now the best banks that we're looking at, the, the, the banks run by true blue bankers, are, have loan to deposit ratios, that's, that's loans divided by the deposits, so that's how much of their deposits they're currently deploying into loans. Those are in like the 80 to 90 percent range, so they're being conservative, they're saying we think that there will be a better time to, to get out there and, and get lending. B of I, at like 110 percent for loan to deposit ratio. So being very aggressive right now, growing loans aggressively, lending aggressively. Um, but then you look at you and, and you look at the 3.3 times tangible book value multiple. And when we compare that to US Bancorp at 2.7 times tangible book value, uh, Wells Fargo at 1.8 times tangible book value, Bank of uh, 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 Bank of Hawaii, which is a, a really well-managed bank, great returns, 2.7 times tangible book value. I mean, all of these are great banks and trading at cheaper multiples, certainly not growing the same way as, uh, as Bank of Internet, but... I guess, I guess the counter to, to the loan to deposit question would be if they continue to gain more deposits at a faster pace than those other competitors, then they'll have more money to put into the new loans. So, sure. So if they continue to grow the deposits and can make loans at higher rates, then they could potentially combats some uh, of that headwind. I, I, can be, I can be proved very wrong on this one, and 32% year-over-year growth in book value, so far so good. They, they are certainly executing as of right now. Yep. Moving on to our focus of the day, uh, Wall Street Journal's uh, Money Beat this morning had an article about how, it said that the market was looking eerily high, and I, I think that is, it's, it's sort of a, a meme now that, that the market is going into high valuations, if not bubble territory, right? Yeah, that's, you're, we're certainly hearing that more so than we did a couple of years ago. I, sure. Nobody's talking about the market being cheap. Right. I, I, think, I think at best people are kind of saying the market is fairly valued right now. And we were just talking about Bank of Internet. And, and to be fair, uh, like I said, the bank is growing really well has the possibility of proving me very wrong when I talk about valuation concerns, but at 3.3 times tangible book value, uh, I, I forget off the top of my head how much the stock is up year to date, but it's been on a crazy run so Over far 100%. this year. Over, there you go. It's, it's doubled, more than doubled so far this year, and just today up 10%. So I think that's the kind of that's the kind of stock, that's the kind of, those are the kind of numbers that people are talking mm -hmm. about and looking at when they're saying the, the market is eerily high. And, you look at some of the, the IPOs coming out recently too. Container Store up more than 100% in the first day. 
And, uh, and, and that's one of, I think it was like six IPOs yeah, or something so, so far this year that have more than doubled on the first day of trading. So it's, it's not crazy to look at these numbers and say the market is looking a little eerily high, but mm -hmm. are, you on the, are you on that page? A little bit. You're starting to hear a little bit of anecdotal evidence of, of people kind of just being more interested in the stock market. I think we saw the third highest inflow to stock funds last month. So more retail investors, mom and pop shops, putting their money into the stock market. So when you see stuff like that, obviously you're going to get maybe a little bit more uneasy than when that stuff's coming out and the market looks cheap on, on the face of it. But I, I still don't think you should be trying to time the overall market. If you own index funds of the S&P, mm -hmm. I don't think you should be trying to sell those based on, oh, I feel like the market's a little overvalued right now. Uh, when, Is that how you're saying it? When that, you... That's how I say it to myself. <laughs> okay. uh, when you, especially when you're looking at index funds and the market as a whole, I think you should be basing your, your sell decisions well, index on... funds isn't a timing strategy. Exactly. These should be life decisions. Am I retiring? Is someone going to college soon? You should be basing it off that, right. not trying to time the market. When you're looking at individual stocks, I think you have to look at it in, in, the, com in the, the composition of your portfolio. If one stock has run up a lot and now makes up a large portion of your portfolio, maybe you could justify scaling it back a little bit. If you're not comfortable with one stock, maybe it's run up to 15% of your portfolio, and that doesn't make you too comfortable. If you're, Bru if you're Bruce Berkowitz, If you're that. Berkowitz, then maybe not so. But I think that's the way you should be looking at it. If you have individual stocks that look overheated, maybe you should consider pairing them back. But if you have index funds, I don't think you should be touching those. What do you think? Well, in, in, terms, of, in terms of pairing back stocks that, that look overheated, I just, over the years, I've learned to get a little bit careful about that. And going back to Bank of Internet, if I was an owner of it, and people, people listening or watching this may be saying, well, of, of course you're, you're not crazy about Bank of Internet. You don't own it. You're not, you, haven't, mm -hmm. you haven't been part of this double so far this year. I, unless a valuation starts to look abjectly crazy, and Bank of Internet's, Bank of Internet's uh, valuation doesn't look abjectly crazy to me. Mm -hmm. uh, un unless you get into that kind of territory where it's like, this does not make any sense on any planet. Uh, that's the point when you sell. Uh, up until then, it's, it's really tough to say. Because when you're making projections about the future, which is what any valuation of any business is going to be based on, or for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, projections about the future, they're inherently uh, difficult to make, and so there's gonna be a range of possibilities, and so you don't wanna cu cut out a, a good performing company from your portfolio uh, just because it's gotten, it's gotten a little bit overheated. In fact, uh, the behavioral concept of loss aversion, basically what, what people do end up doing there is they hold on to losing stocks too long and they, they cut their winning stocks too soon because they see a winning stock go up and they say, oh, well, of course it's going gonna, it's mm -hmm. to fall back down now. A lot of times that doesn't happen. And, and, and a good example of that right here at The Motley Fool is, is David Gardner recommending Amazon all the way back in 1997. And how much has it gone up from 97, from 97 to 2000, from 2000 to mm -hmm. 2005? Since 97, that's been a 100 bagger. And if David had decided along the way, oh, well, now's the time to sell because this has mm -hmm. gone up a, a bunch, um, you miss out on that. Right. And that's, that's why I highlight the composition of the portfolio. I don't, just because something went up, I don't think you should sell it. I don't think that's, that's exactly the case. what you said. That's not David. what I was saying. Uh, I, I was, I was saying, saying no, I wasn't, I wasn't that, implying that, that makes were... up a huge portion, then right. you could, I think you should consider it. So, so what, are, what are stocks today in this eerily high market that you, or companies that are still valued at reasonable, uh, reasonable places to buy? Right. Any longtime viewer, longtime listener knows that we talk about Markel a lot, whether it be on the Market Foolery podcast, on this podcast. We really like the business, the management team, and I still think it's an undervalued stock. If you look at the stock this year, I'm pretty sure it's lagged the market. hasn't done yeah. much, and that can make people think, well, it, it hasn't even done well in 2013. This, this business stinks. But you have to look a long-term view here, and you look at the business, the insurance business, they write good insurance. Mm -hmm. We know they do. They have a long track record of writing good insurance. When you look at AIG, we can't necessarily say that. We're hoping they write good insurance in the future. Oh, that, they will. But that hasn't been the case <laughs> in the past. We know we're going to get good insurance. We know that over time they've, they've outperformed the market from an investment perspective by a couple percentage points. And that doesn't sound like a lot in one You mean the money time. they're investing internally right. Tom, that Tom Gaynor's investing in. Exactly. Right. So they don't crush the market by 10 percentage points every year, but a couple percentage points compounded over time. That makes, makes a, a difference. big difference. When you look at the valuation trading under 1.2 times book value, it looks pretty cheap. So I think in this market that looks eerily high, as the, as the article says, I would feel very comfortable buying more Markel. Okay. Uh, from my perspective, 
we, we look at the big banks a, a lot here as, as undervalued. W one of the ones, when, when we look at that comparison, we end up saying, oh, well, Wells Fargo looks a little bit uh, richly valued compared to the others. And it does look richly valued compared to the others. But again, looking at an eerily high market, Wells Fargo at 1.8 times tangible book value, the kind of business that you have there, the kind of returns that you have there. And from a legal perspective, we were talking about this last week, when you, when you look at the fact that Wells, it just doesn't look like Wells Fargo is going to have anywhere near the legal liabilities of a Bank of America or of a J.P. Morgan, mm -hmm. I, think bank, uh, I think Wells Fargo uh, is, a, is a very good bet at this, uh, at this valuation. You're getting a dividend, too. That helps. You are getting a dividend. Thanks, Dan. All right. Moving on to the mailbag. <laughs> we, we continue to get the emails rolling in. As a reminder, email address WTMI at fool.com. Where the money is, that's our initials, WTMI at fool.com. Send us comments, questions, anything. Uh, and today we have a, we had a comment, I guess it really is, it is. from Mike Volberding. David, you want to read it to us? Our comment, I guess, was, since your podcast is still relatively new, I'd like to hear on air a summation on what financials you intend to cover in your universe of stocks. And he, he noted that we've been talking a lot about the mortgage REITs, he said, are you always going to be talking about the mortgage rates? I don't care that much about mortgage rates. <laughs> Where the money explain, is, mortgage rates. <laughs> explain yourself. So, so Matt, what are we going to cover here? Is it, are we just talking about mortgage rates and Bank of America? Well, <laughs> well let, let, me, let me first say, part of the reason that we've been talking a lot about mortgage rates, uh, there's, there's two broad reasons. Number one is that there are a fair number of people uh, of our audience who are interested in the mortgage rates because they pay such high dividends. I mean, you look at you look at Annaly, you look at Two Harbors, and you've got double-digit dividends still with yep. both of those. Uh, and, and in such a low interest rate environment, uh, there are a lot of people looking for yield, and that's one place to go, for better or for worse, mm -hmm. right? For, for, from that perspective. The other reason is is that it's been a very volatile time for the mortgage rates because interest rates have been so volatile, and you've got all this Fed stuff going on. However. This will not be the Bank of America and Mortgage REITs show. And so I'm, I was glad for Mike's comment uh, to kind of push us to make sure that we're getting out and covering the rest of the, the, rest of the sub industries and the financials uh, because banking, and, and that runs from the mega banks, which obviously we'll talk about a little bit more than the other banks because they're so big, because mm -hmm. so many more people have them in their portfolios. Uh, we'll be talking about those a little bit more, but the super regionals, there are a lot of good banks in there. We did a Rank It segment last week on those. Uh, even the, We'll go down to the regionals and the community banks, maybe somewhat a little bit less, but we'll definitely be covering some mm -hmm. of the regionals because there are some really good banks there. Uh, bank of Hawaii, which I just uh, mentioned earlier in this show, really good regional bank to that particular state, really, but very well managed, great returns there. Um, Insurance, uh, we'll be covering the property and casualty, life and health, uh, reinsurance. We'll be going out into credit cards. We actually mm -hmm. have spoken a lot about Visa and MasterCard on the show. PayPal. Uh, PayPal, American Express a little bit. So, so the idea is that we really will be covering the breadth of the uh, financial industry. Uh, but to Mike's point, we have been focusing a, a bit on a bit, maybe a bit too much on mortgage REITs lately, and uh, and we're glad for his comment. And if you want to hear about anything else, you can email us. Exactly. If WTMI, if viewers or listeners have something in particular that they want to hear about, uh, shoot us an email. And to be fair, Mike has shot us an email yep. and, and said he has specific things he wants to hear about, so we will address that. But again, WTMI at fool.com. Uh, love to hear from our listeners. All right. Game for the day. Would you rather? Mm -hmm. Let's kick it off. We've got a, do we have slides? Oh, yes, 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 we have slides. Would you rather, David, own shares of AIG or Berkshire Hathaway? Uh, so this is directed to me personally. Uh, yeah. I think it would depend on your situation, which one you'd feel more comfortable with. I said you, David. I, I'm, I'm comfortable with a little bit more risk in my portfolio, mm -hmm. so I'm going with, with AIG. It's not as, not as much of a sure thing as Berkshire Hathaway. There's still a lot of operations on the mend there. The valuation looks good. There's still risks outstanding in terms of them actually being able to, to do well over time. But I'm going with AIG. What do you say? Uh, as much as I hate to agree with you, I'm going to say AIG as well. I actually own both of these in my personal portfolio. I actually own a lot more of Berkshire Hathaway than AIG. But if you give me X amount of money, buy one or the other, it's all AIG. All right. Number two scenario. Would you rather short Bank of America or Citigroup? How are you being risky? Who are you shorting there? I know we don't talk about a lot, a lot about shorting here, and it can be a risky enterprise. No, we don't. But what do you say? I, I'm not. I'm actually not a big fan of shorting, but 
if I were to short one of the, I, I think the, the risk is asymmetric in shorting. That's why I really don't like it. Because if, if it gets away from you on the other end, anyway, I digress. I'm trying to give myself time to think. I, I think I'd rather short Bank of America. Even though I'm, maybe I'm a bigger fan of Bank of America, but I just bought Citigroup for myself. So I own both of these now. I own all four of the stocks we've talked about <laughs> so far, jeez. I would rather short Bank of America. I think in terms of big downsides that could come out of nowhere, you might say black swans. I don't know if black swan is mm -hmm. exactly the right thing to say. I think there's more that we could see out of Bank of America from that than Citigroup. Citigroup, I just think, Mike Corbett is really doing a good job of making Citigroup pretty vanilla. Uh, he, it is pretty vanilla, but it's still got its hands in a lot more things than Bank of America. You talk about potential black swans, and I'm not trying to forecast any, but if there was to happen in, in some part of the world, it's a bigger chance that it's going to impact Citigroup than Bank of America. So I'm Are you sit. forecasting a crash in an emerging yep, market? Yep, market. <laughs> market. The forecast is coming. <laughs> David Hansen. Oh, you're, right. So you're shorting Citigroup? In that scenario, yes, but not in real life. Okay. All right, next scenario. Final question. We've got, would you rather own shares of Aflac or, and I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a couple here and you gotta tell me which, which one, Aflac or Markel? Markel. Aflac or Travelers? Aflac. Aflac or Allstate? Aflac. Fair enough. What do you what? say? Uh, of these three? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd go Markel over Aflac, Travelers over Aflac. I don't know, Travelers or Aflac is a tough one. I would definitely go Aflac over Allstate. Why Markel over Aflac for you? I just gave the Markel pitch. I think over uh, time, yeah, fair. I think it, it's a clearer path to upside and more limited downside there. Okay. Uh, let's finish off the show here. Going over to the Twitter sphere, the Twitter sphere. It, it is the Twitter sphere, right? Twitter sphere. All right, give us the first tweet. The first tweet is from Nick Timoros. He says, census, U.S. home ownership rate at 65.1% in Q3, seasonally adjusted, unchanged from Q2 which is the lowest since 1995. This is a trend that we've seen coming out of the recession. When we were at Columbia Business School talking to Chris Mayer, we asked him, is this the new normal? Are we moving to a renter society? He says, no. Over the long run, he doesn't think that's the case. When we look at the lifetime of Americans, around 85% will own a home in their life. That's a huge percentage. We're not moving right towards a renter society quite yet. Next tweet. Yeah, next tweet. Agreed, I agree. Uh, this is from Matthew Argersinger, our own Matthew That's, Argersinger at The Fool. This, <laughs> yes, we, we do own it. At M, -A, at M Argersinger, sorry. Uh, that's his Twitter handle. Prepping for hashtag Z earnings tomorrow with at TMF JMO. That's uh, Jason Moser. Questions for Zillow CEO Spencer Raskoff. Send them. And by tomorrow, he means today. Right. Tuesday. Was, that was from Tuesday. yesterday. David, you wrote an article about this. What's going on? You can, send your, you can send your questions via Twitter, Facebook, hashtag Z earnings. They will be put into a, a pot, I guess, a hopper. if you will. A hopper of questions. Hopper. And Zillow Question CEO hopper. could pick your question and answer it on the earnings call, or, and we will be doing a interview after the earnings call. It'll be released on fool.com. Exclusive interview with Spencer Raskoff. You can tune in. It'll probably be going up by the time this podcast is up and running right around now. So if you check fool.com right now in, in, in the evening, even if it's there. not up, go to fool.com anyway. Yeah, it's, it's a, a great play, site. Get, great place to go. Great right. place to go. Final and, tweet. And, and also there's this, that, that Twitter conversation yeah. after, and that's the hashtag Z earnings, mm -hmm. hashtag letter Z earnings, and that's a partnership. Whether, whether you're a, a Zillow bull bear, take part. Yeah, either okay. way. I mean, and it really could be interesting to hear what Raskoff has to say about the housing market in general and the, the tech part of it, which is where Zillow uh, comes into the picture. Yep. Finish this off, David. Final tweet is from our own. We own our it. own, yeah. Morgan Housel we definitely at TMF Housel. He says, Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> is now worth $28 for every second he's been alive. Tick, tick, tick. Matt, how much are you oh, worth for a second? I, know, I calculated I knew, I knew, mine. <laughs> did you really? I did. Let's, I, you let's just... <laughs> you didn't give me a check. That is not the kind of thing that I could... But let me... Before, before you reveal, before the big reveal of how much you're worth for every second... If I made twenty, if I was worth twenty-eight dollars for every second, I would feel much better about spending the six dollars that it costs to get the pumpkin spice latte that I love at Starbucks. You could afford it I, easily. Uh, well, I did learn that I've been alive for less than a billion seconds. So okay. I did that calculation. That was encouraging. A billion seconds. Um, I, my my net worth is around one one hundredth of a penny per second I've been alive. <laughs> so I'm coming for you, Zuck. One one hundredth of a penny. I'm coming for you. That's very impressive. All right. All right, folks, that is our show for today. 
tweeted us. Our Twitter handle is at TMF Financials. Comments, questions, I don't know what else. Could, compliments, compliments Hate on David's mail. shirt. Hate mail works bow too. Bowtie suggestions. Uh, <laughs> Bowtie suggestions. Uh, email address is, at, is WTMI at fool.com. Same thing, email us. I'm Matt Kopenheffer. This is David Hansen. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.